Solomon taking care of business. I am blessed to have a little bit of extra time with Chasm Sultan. We didn't have enough time in our uh, FM broadcast in part one to cover a very extensive career, so we're going to try to do a lightning round <laughs> of additional material. Currently, you're with Blue Oyster Cult. Yeah, I'll take Blue Oyster Cult for 800, please. <laughs> <laughs> so so how, did, how did that uh, come about? Uh, well, I've known uh, I've known the boys uh, for a very very long time. We toured together in 1978. I want to say uh, we did a tour, Utopia and uh, and Blue Oyster Cult. I'm pretty sure it was a co bill, uh, and we we went from Vancouver to Toronto uh, in January. And uh, so we toured Canada in the middle of January. It was the worst experience of my entire life. But we came, we became very, very close as uh, as bandmates and friends. Uh, and I've always, uh, I've always uh, been close to Eric and Buck, and I know the Bouchards and Alan, who's passed away, uh, Alan Lanier. Um, and so when they needed uh, they needed a bass player because uh, Rudy Sarzo, who, who was working with them, went to do some other stuff. Uh, they had a vacancy that they needed filled. I had some time. Uh, it, it, actually, they work weekends, so it's not like they tour constantly. So it's a weekend gig for me. It's like you're you're, you're out on Friday, you're home on Sunday. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um- what is the experience of being in that band as opposed to maybe some of the other bands that you were in? Oh, I, I don't know that you could compare them. I mean, they're, you know, they're the Blue Oyster Cult is Blue Oyster Cult. They're great musicians, great bunch of guys. Uh, the only two original members are Buck and Eric. Uh, the other uh, two musicians in the band is uh, this guitar player by the name of Richie Castellano, who's absolutely a brilliant musician. He's fantastic. Um, and he actually plays on my record, on my solo record. And the drummer, Jules Rodino, uh, another Long Island guy, is a, he's just a, a, a love to play with. Uh, he's great, and he and I have become close over the last year and a half, two years of playing together. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, a lot of times it's, it's not about how well you play, it's about how well you play with others. Ah. So let's talk about the new cars. Yes. I, I actually saw you at with uh, I was in the audience I believe it was Jones Beach mm-hmm. uh, when you did the new cars tour uh-huh. uh, tell us about that um, it, the, that kind of came about as uh, w- there was a, a manager or management company 10th Street management that uh, um, was handling the uh, the old cars, or they wanted to get the old cars back together. It's a guy by the name of Alan Kovac, who's a pretty famous manager in the business, famous for reviving careers. Uh, he took uh, Debbie Harry and made her a big star again. He took Meatloaf and made him a big star again. Uh, he's been managing Motley Crue for you know for the last twenty years, twenty five years. In any case, a great manager. Um, and he had this idea that he was going to put the cars back together again. Well, the only people that signed on to it were, uh, Eric, uh, were um, Greg Hawks and Elliot Easton. Yeah. Rick really didn't want to do it. The drummer didn't want to do it. And Ben or the bass player uh, had since passed away. Um, so then they got this uh, brilliant idea that they were going to ask Todd to do it, uh, to step in and kind of be the front man. Um, and once Todd said that he was going to sign on to it, uh, it was a no brainer that, cause I knew Alan from meatloaf and I called Alan and said, you know, I'd, I'd be the perfect bass player. So that's how I wound up doing that. That, that was a great tour. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And- we had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it ended prematurely. Elliot got hurt uh, in the middle of, uh, of our tour, and it kind of took the wind out of, out of our sails. We never really recovered from it because we were in the middle of a, of a two-and-a-half-month tour that we had to abruptly end. Uh, Elliot broke his shoulder, uh, and it was going to take six weeks for him to recover from it. Uh, so we lost any momentum that we had, and uh, it just wound up not happening. Will it ever happen again? I doubt it. Okay. Now, what's interesting is I have, I have two little daughters, and one of my daughters uh, likes to watch uh, you know, kid, children's TV. Uh-huh. And I'm watching a show called Yo Gabba Gabba. 
I and I see, it. A, I see a gentleman who says, hi, I'm Greg. And he starts playing music. And I, I look at my wife. I said, this, this is Greg from the Cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and he's like, a, and, and my three-year-old's watching this. And I'm like, wow, that's, you know, it's mind-blowing. Because I guess you never know where people will pop up. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Ringo was uh, uh, what, the, the, the train guy for the longest time, too. <laughs> you know. So, uh, Joan Jett. Let's talk about Joan Jett. Sure. Um, Joan Jett from Long Beach, New York. Yeah. And not too far from my office. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, a, a member of my family who's sadly no longer with us um, actually knew Joan Jett personally and mm-hmm. uh, worked with her. Uh, and I actually met Joan Jett at the Long Island Music Hall of Fame Awards. Uh-huh. Uh, let's talk about Joan Jett and the Black Heart. And actually, I, one of my guests was Ricky Bird. Uh-huh. So let's talk about Joan Jett. How did, how did that come about and how long were you with the Joan Jett Band? Um, well, a, a guy that I grew up with, uh, Tommy Price, uh, was in the mid eighties, uh, an extremely sought after, uh, session player, drummer. Uh, and we've known, we had known each other since we were about 11 or 12 years old on Staten Island where we grew up. And we actually played in our first band together. Uh, Tommy became a, an extremely, uh, desired, uh, uh drummer. For uh, for records in uh, in the New York area during the '80s, when you know when people were making records with session uh, players, um, so Joan called him to play on uh, on one of her records, and she needed a bass player. And uh, Tommy said, "I have my my buddy plays bass. You know, he's he's played with Todd Runger, and he plays with, he used to play with with uh, this uh, that one who whatever." And she said, "Okay, bring him down." And I went down and. Uh, and I, uh, I I started playing with her, and I guess we did a record in 1986. Um, but I didn't join the band until 1987, and I wound up in being a Blackheart for 87, 88, and most of 89. Um, and then I left to uh, work with another band. Uh, but that was uh, that was a great time for me. I I, I love Joan. Congratulations for she's just been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well deserved. Uh, yeah, well deserved. absolutely, and completely well deserved. And uh, it was a it was a highlight of my career working with Joan. Uh, but the 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 flip side of that was it's it, it's not really the kind of music that I am most comfortable playing. Although I can certainly play it. Um, if if I had a choice of door number one, door number two, door number three, and and Joan was door number three, I probably wouldn't choose door number three. But I thoroughly enjoyed playing with Joan. I love her. She's great, and she's a really really great person. She seems like a lot of fun because she treated the media very well um, when we were there, and uh, and I, and you know some of her songs are really cool, like um, I hate myself for loving you. I mean, you gotta just love a song like that. Um, yeah, well, that's me. I played bass on that song. Yeah, and I think that's just 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 completely awesome. Yeah, uh, Meatloaf. Uh, yeah. Way back in 1978, mm-hmm. I believe I was at St. John's University uh-huh. watching Meatloaf uh, perform "Bad Out of Hell" uh-huh. when he was in a wheelchair because he uh-huh. you know, <laughs> broke his leg. Right. So yeah. now I know that you were on the "Bad Out of Hell" album. Yes. So let's talk about that now. That was Jim Steinman who wrote the songs, and did did Todd produce that? Yes, Todd produced that record. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, we were, I had just joined the band. I, uh, this is 1977. I, I joined in April of 1976. And uh, so I was only in the band for about a year. And um, I guess it was October, maybe, middle of October, something like that, of 77. And my my phone rang. I was living with Roger Powell in a, in, in a uh, house not too far from Woodstock. And the phone rings, and it's Todd, and, and Todd says, uh, you want to play on a record I'm producing? And I said, yeah, okay, yeah, why not? I said, uh, who's the artist? He said, it's a guy named Meatloaf. <laughs> I said, okay, so why, why, are you, why are you doing this? Why, what is the joke here? I, I'm, not, I'm not getting it. What, come on, really? And he said, if you want to play on the record, just show up at the studio at 1 o'clock. So, so uh, through his annoyance, I got, I got in my car and drove up to uh, to um, the uh, Bearsville Studios where uh, Jim 
Meatloaf, Rory Dodd, Ellen Foley um, were uh, were going to play the songs for the band to uh, start rehearsing, and that that whole rehearsal we did about three weeks of rehearsals before we actually went into the studio. It was myself, Todd, Roy Bitten, and Max Weinberg. That oh, was from the that E Street the, Band. Yeah, that was the band, uh, and and then we did, we we recorded that record. Every every song was done in one take. Um, and, uh, it was just, uh, I laughed the entire time I, I was playing it. I just didn't think I'd ever hear it again. I thought this, you know, just like, let me just take the money and run, uh, because I, uh, why anybody would want to record this material is totally beyond me. Little did I know that, uh, it would be the third biggest selling record of all time. And, and you were part of it. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah. Um, when when they did Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, I, I guess they had to put all the Phil Rizzuto stuff in at some other point. But what were you thinking about that song when they were sort of laying that down? Well, we had no idea what was going to happen in that part. That was just a blank uh, three minute section or a two and a half minute section that uh, we didn't know. It was just a jam. Uh, I, I'm sure Jim knew exactly what he wanted to put in there. Um, and when they did put Phil Rizzuto in, uh, they just recorded Phil doing a play-by-play. He had no idea that, that they were going to put him into the song. He wasn't happy with it. Yeah, I, I actually met both Phil Rizzuto and Carla DeVita uh-huh. <laughs> at different times. I met uh-huh. Carla DeVita in Binghamton mm-hmm. uh, when she produced an album called It's a Cool World, Isn't It? And I actually have the autographed vinyl record. Mm-hmm. And I met Phil Rizzuto at, at some trade show, and he actually – talked about it was before i did radio but he actually expressed his unhappiness yeah he's he's like a devout christian you know a catholic uh, and uh he does not he did not want to be uh if if he had known that that he was doing a play-by-play that was uh depicting a a guy and a girl in the backseat of a car you know having their first little uh sexual experience he wouldn't have done it well i guess but think of how Think of how many people know that song and how how often that song is played. Well, they still, you know, you know uh, they still uh, weddings. You know, people still act that song out at weddings and proms. It's kind of amazing. So let's move on to Utopia. How, mm-hmm. how how did you become a part of the Utopia band? And I know that there was like a <clears throat> Utopia sort of with different people before it settled to the four main people. Uh. I, I I heard about the audition through a friend, um, and was told to if I if I was interested in it that I needed to call a certain person who, at that time, was helping me um, learn piano. This is by the guy by the name of Michael Kamen, who was a famous uh, composer um, uh, and songwriter in his, in his own right. Um, it was not no longer with us. Uh, uh, so he knew me as a uh, as a piano player, not as a bass player, because I was playing piano with uh, Cherry Vanilla at the time. So when I called him and I said, I, I understand that uh, Todd Rundgren is, is uh, auditioning bass players, because he was friends with Roger Powell, and Roger had told him, Michael, we're looking for a bass player. If you know of anybody, let me know. He said, well, Kasim, I, I, I don't know you as a bass player. He said, God, you know, can you play bass? I said, well, yeah, that's kind of like my main instrument. You know, I'm just playing piano with Cherry because I wanted to be, become a piano player, too. Uh, and he said, okay, I'll recommend you. So he called <laughs> Roger. I, I, it's the next day, Roger, my pal, called my, my parents' house. I was living at my parents' and, uh, and said, you know, do you want to come up and audition for, for the band? So uh, I, I borrowed 20 bucks from my uncle, and I went to the Port Authority. I took a, a Adirondack Trailways bus up to uh, Kingston, New York. Roger picked me up, drove to Woodstock, practiced uh, with Roger and Willie, just the, the drummer and the keyboard player, for a day. The next day, Todd came home from a vacation that he was on. Uh, we played together, and, uh, and I went home that night. Thinking that you know, pff, no way. I was, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, and the next day, Roger called me and said that uh, I had made the band. Wow. Well, when was the first time you were in your car and you actually heard one of your own songs on the radio? Oh God! 
And what was that like? I think the, the, the one that sticks out in my mind was uh, when I was in my car and I'm, I was on Staten Island and I was listening to AM radio. Uh, FM radio was just coming into its own. But I was listening to AM radio and I heard Set Me Free on it. And, and what was the, what was the, was it, what was it like? I mean, you know, was it like, wow. It was a, I mean, it was amazing. It was just, a, it, it, you can't buy feelings like that. You just, you, it's, it's indescribable. It's, it's, va- it's, <clears throat> it's kind of a, a cross between validation and euphoria. <laughs> you know? did, did you call the station up and ask them to play it again? <laughs> N- no, I don't think I did. I was just content with that little bit that I, that I got, that, that little piece of heaven that I got. Wow. Um, for, for, for all the, the music that you have played and all the music that you will play, what what is the one thing that you think is sort of the unifying theme of all of the experience you've you've had in rock? The unifying theme? Yeah, I, I'll tell you. You know, when you when you started uh, asking me this question, I, my 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 uh, head cocked and my eyes went like in a what? But I think that it's, uh, the, that the answer just came to me. It's that that I have been lucky enough um, and blessed enough that I can I can pretty much play any any kind of music that's put in front of me. You know, I might not be the best person in the world to play it, but I can certainly keep my own. Uh and I can play with Joan and I can play with Hall and Oates. Uh I can play with Richie Sambora and I can play with uh Patty S- Smith or or Celine Dion, you know. Um uh, it doesn't matter what the music is, I I can play it and uh and that's a great feeling. That is a great feeling. And it it also is a great expression of your incredible talent. Well, I you, you know, I don't know I, I don't know that I'm I'm incredibly talented. I just know that I do something that that I've been able to survive on <laughs> for the past thirty eight years. And, and and for the next thirty eight years, what do we what well, do we have hope, in store? Yeah, Jesus Christ, I'll be almost ninety by I'll be over ninety by then. Well Let's they'll not be get they'll carried be, away. They'll be good medicine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what what do you what do you see uh on the road ahead? Um, well, I'm, I'm hard at work on this record. I have live shows coming up for this, uh, for this record. I'm looking to do as much performing as I possibly can behind it. And, uh, you know, because of this, of the initial success of this record, uh, and, and the amount of, of, uh, positive, uh, feedback that I've gotten, both reviews and press and, and stuff like that, um, I'm thinking that, you know what, maybe I, I might have to do another record pretty soon well if that's the case i would love you to be back on our show i would love to and and uh maybe we'll even try to debut it and do a whole you know rock and roll uh thing and and really get in, get into the deep tracks of the album yeah all right so this is richard solomon chasm sultan thank you for being a part of our show from being a part of my radio audience and being uh part of chasm's incredible loyal uh fan base that's been around for a long long time from me to you, thank you immensely for, for being with me uh, and, and giving me so much time and your heart and your soul in this interview. Thank you so much, Rich, for having me. I really appreciate Alrighty. it.